Good morning. Good to see you here this morning. Glad you made it without slipping and sliding too much. Let's start our service this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand with me and sing, How Great Thou Art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Be seated. Consider Psalm 67 with me. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the people praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May that be true in our own hearts and spirits this morning as we continue. Next, let's sing How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. So this is our fifth Sunday, Favorite Hymn Sunday. Every fifth Sunday we sing just favorite hymns. And if I were choosing 
20 favorite hymns, that one would be in it. Maybe even 10. So let's pray to the God who will never, ever forsake his people. Join me. Lord, we have leaned on Jesus for repose. We have come to him for new lives, to learn a new way, to experience grace and the power of his spirit. And you have welcomed us, not turned us away. You've kept us, even when we failed and fallen. You are good in all your ways, gracious and loving, slow to anger, filled with compassion. You are our God. Our hope is in you. This morning, we want to worship you with these favorite hymns, so would you help us? Would you help us not just sing words, but to give praise to you for all that you've done for us, to worship you, not just with our words, but with our lives, which we offer to you in the good, sweet name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. A reading is from Isaiah 49, 5 through 7. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and rise up, princes will see and bow down, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Sing with me, be thou my vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my light. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only first in my heart. I King of heaven, my treasure thou art. I King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall. Still be my vision, O ruler of all. Please stand if you're able for the reading of the gospel. A reading from Matthew 5, 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. You can be seated. 
This is a fifth Sunday, which means we also share testimonies on fifth Sundays. And I decided to take advantage of the opportunity to share my story with you. Uh, normally, I don't want to do that because you guys hear so much about my life. I, I think I don't have any secrets left anymore. But because of changes that are coming, I thought it was appropriate for me to share my story with you now. So I was in my study early one morning, as I am almost every morning of my life, meditating on scripture and praying, and two words came to my mind with remarkable clarity. They were surprising, not only because of the clarity, but because of the words themselves. I wasn't sure what they meant, and I had no idea why they had come to mind. So I stopped doing what I was doing, and I wrote them on a piece of scrap paper so that I wouldn't forget, although I wouldn't have forgotten. And then I went back to my prayers. After my prayer time, I looked up those words on the computer and did a little research. The two words were lake turnover. I knew that lakes turned over, though it's not something I'd ever given any thought to. Uh, I don't know that I had heard those words in years, maybe in decades. What I'd read in the Bible had nothing to do with lakes or with water or anything of the sort. But these words just seemed to be important to me, and they also seemed to have come out of the blue. So after my time of prayer and Bible reading, as I was researching lake turnover, I discovered that deep lakes in the colder climates turn over. So as the surface water cools, it sinks, it becomes denser, and it sinks, displacing the water below it, which rises to the top. When that happens, there's a release of oxygen into the lake, which helps with the lake's overall health. At the same time, there are other gases besides oxygen that are trapped in the bottom of the lake, and when lakes turn over, often there's an unpleasant odor because methane and other things come up. It struck me with great clarity that this lake turnover was happening at Lockwood. Some of the people in leadership had moved, had been moved by age, by COVID, by some trial or other, from foundational positions where they held up the rest of us. And others were taking their place. In some ways, that transition is unpleasant. Uh, we would stop it if we could. But I believed and believed that God was at work in the process for the overall health of the church. That was over a year ago when this happened. Since then, I have sought God's wisdom and guidance and received it on numerous occasions. I was again in my prayers and in the scriptures and how often things have happened that have changed, redirected, and blessed my life coming out of prayer times. Kevin just pointed out to me this week how, how often one sees in the book of Acts that it's right when people pray that something happens over and over again. And that's been the case in my life. Well, I was in... Uh, our D group was in Colossians, and I was reading Colossians chapter 4, almost at the very end of the book, and a message is relayed to Archippus from St. Paul, which is, finish the work you've been given to do. Those words just jumped off the page at me. God was speaking them to me. Finish the work you've been given to do. God has also provided me with other guidance in the scriptures and in my prayers uh, with Karen, as she and I have talked and prayed together, and with other people, both inside and outside the church. It was clear to me last year, from the very first, that Karen and I would be part of the turnover. And because we love Lockwood, which is to say we love you, that is a sad thought to us. But if God is telling me to finish up the work, he must be preparing someone else to take over the work. I remember when I came here, almost 35 years ago, I was about 12 at the time. <laughs> but it was 
It was exciting. And things were happening. And the church was growing. And that fills me with hope. Karen and I don't know what we'll do next. Um, God has not made that clear to us. It would be easier and more comfortable to stay here where we're loved and where we love people. But I believe it would also be to dis disobey our Lord, betray our trust, and hinder the church that we love. We don't have a date. There are still things that need to be finished up. The Lord didn't tell me what I was doing next, but he told me to finish up what I've begun. So I expect that sometime during this year, both the Loopers and Lockwood will be ready to take the next step. This is going to be an exciting time. The work of God's Spirit may become more apparent among us than ever. I hope that when the new senior pastor steps into this pulpit, he is part of a church that is growing, that is filled with hope, and that is seeing evidence of God's blessing on every hand. I also hope to see a new group of people taking on positions of service and responsibility. The lake's turning over, and some people are going to have to fill those places. God, I believe, will call some of you into those places of service, including places of leadership, where you will support others in their walk with Christ. This is going to be a time when people grow in their knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus. I tend, by personality, to try to get ahead of things and control them. Karen and I could be tempted to worry about our future or to worry about our church. But we know that God has loved and blessed us, and we have exalted in his blessing on our lives and our children's lives We've recognized it and been grateful for it for many generations. And we know that God loves and, and has blessed Lockwood Community Church. Almost 35 years ago, a great pastor at Lockwood left. And I came to take his place. And that transition was for Lockwood's blessing. And so will this transition be. Karen and I are going to know God better through this transition than we know him now. In times of uncertainty, we have always found him to be sure and certain. And Lockwood will find that too. We're not leaving yet. I hope no one will push me out the door. There are still some things to wrap up and it could take the better part of a year. We don't know at this point. But when we leave, we will, to borrow St. Paul's phrase, take you with us in our hearts. We are who we are, in large part because of how God has shaped us in our interactions with you. And we are full of gratitude to him and to you for that. Now, with that said, I'm going to invite you to stand with me and how it's going to come and lead us in another hymn. And by the way, you're, you are welcome to talk with me about any of these things. Um, like I said, I, I don't know that I have any secrets left after 35 years of living here, and I don't intend to keep any. So if you want to ask me questions, uh, challenge my thinking, uh, pray for me, any of that kind of stuff. We'd be happy for you to do that. Stand with us and we'll sing. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever It is well, it is 
well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glory. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul, it is well. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well. time for us to share in the offering. So guys, if you would come and help us with that, we'd appreciate that. If you're new to us today, and I know that we don't have many of our regular people and we don't have many new people today, but if you are new to us, don't feel like you have to be part of the offering. We're just glad that you're here and glad that you can worship with us. If we are giving, let's do this not out of rote. We're not trying to keep the lights on. We're trying to honor our God and show him our love. So let's make this just a token of our gift to him, which is our own lives. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. We're not trying to repay you. We're saying that everything we are and have is yours. And we're glad that it's so. Receive this to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to mention a few things in your bulletin. If you'll look there, I'll just highlight a few things. You can read about giving statements. I, we've mentioned Valentine cards over and over again. If you have people in your home who are in the military or are off to college, we want to encourage them with a Valentine card and with a gift card, and you can see ways to help with that in, in the bulletin. If you can't help with that, would you let us know, um, and we'd be glad to have your help. So read about the Ladies' Stay Away. That's coming up here at the end of February. Um, read about the annual meeting results. There's a winter gospel concert here. So um, Joe Renshaw and 
Justified Quartet are going to be here on the 18th of, Fe of February, so that's coming up in just a few weeks, on a Saturday evening from 5 until 7.30 here in the auditorium. I want to invite you to join us for that. Read about the couple's getaway. That is in September normally, but this is a little bit different. So there's going to be a couple who help uh, married couples go through the journey of marriage and flourish in it. You can read all about that and then contact Hal if you have interest in being a part of that. You can see some ways to be involved at the food pantry with our Lockwood ladies um, and some things that are going on. So I'm just going to have you read the rest of that. I guess I'll mention one thing. Men's breakfast this Saturday, 7.30 to 10. So if you want to be a part of that, guys, would you mark it on the tear-off? I know the offering plate's already gone by, but you can put it in the box out by the mailboxes for the office, and we'll get it. That's just to let us know how much to prepare for the breakfast time. Also in your bulletin, you'll see a prayer panel. I want to encourage you to look at that right now. We're not going to mention the folks' names in this service because of the, the fact that it's going online. But you can see who they are. Would you pray for them today, here, pray for them during the week, and then call them, send them a card, see what you can do to be of help to them. Let's pray right now. Lord, the people on our prayer list are dear to us. We know that they're also dear to you. We know that you're not afraid for them, that you'll not abandon them, but that you'll help them. I pray that you'll also help them trust you in the midst of some trying times. I, I pray that you will send them help in some cases, from in this room. Send them people. Send them meals. Send them cards through us. Send them phone calls and encouragement and rides to doctors and whatever they might need. I pray that you'll go beyond what you can do through us for them and bring healing and strength and encouragement. Lord, we pray for the other churches in our, our community, our extended family, the people that we love who belong to you. Would you bless them and their churches, cause them to thrive for the name and for the sake of Jesus. Fill with power their every good purpose. Speak to them by your word because your word gives life. And would you do that for us now? Speak to us so that we understand. Speak to us so that we can act in accordance with what's right and good and pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in 1 Peter chapter 2 today. <clears throat> I'm going to read for us verses 9 through 12. 1 Peter chapter 2, this is verse 9. But you, so he's contrasting people who have come over to Jesus' side with people who have not. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world, aliens and strangers, that, so... There was a lot of movement around the Mediterranean at that time, as there have been in recent years. And so when you think of aliens and strangers, think of someone who's come from another place. So in our country, think of somebody who's from uh, Nicaragua, who is living here. They're not citizens. This is not their home. 
and yet they're living here. That's the idea. We're living here in the world, but our citizenship is in heaven. As aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So this is the final message in the series that examines our church vision statement through the lens of scripture. The vision statement is committed to Christ, to Christ-likeness, to each other, and to the world. This week we explore that final one, the commitment to the world, and we do so against the backdrop of the passage I just read for you from 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2 is one of many scriptures that address the Christian's complex relationship to the world. We're not going to see everything here, but we will see some things that we can put into practice in our own church and in our own lives. In our text, there are four principal issues that have bearing on our commitment to the world. The first is who we are. The second is what we do. The third is how we do it. And the fourth is why we do it. So who we are, what we do, how we do it, why we do it. Peter starts with who we are. Well, to be clear, that's where he starts in this particular text. But in the larger context of the letter, he starts not with us at all, but with God and what God has done through Christ in the world. Who we are comes out of what God has done, and what we do comes out of who we are. We Americans are tempted to skip over the character part to get to the practical stuff. Give me the job description. Show me what to do and how to do it. But that's a mistake. That's like hiring an employee based only on their skill set and without regard to their character. So what if they've left their past five jobs within the first 12 months? They can write code. But God knows that the quality of our contribution depends on the development of our character. He shapes who we are, and that changes what we do. Peter lists six truths about who we are in verses 9 and 10. So in verse 9, believers in Jesus are, first, a chosen people. That's something we ought to constantly celebrate. We were chosen. God wanted us. He didn't choose us because he needed us. If that were the case, when he no longer needed us, he'd lose interest. He didn't choose us because we were maybe just barely better than someone else. He chose us because his heart is set on us. He chose us because of what he wanted to do for us. We are not the cast off, the unwanted, or the overlooked. We are the chosen. But don't assume that the choice is all about getting into heaven. <clears throat> Life is not a raffle for an all-expense-paid trip to a cosmic Disney world. We are chosen to join heaven, to work for heaven, to be on staff for the king of heaven. Chris Wright put it this way. It's as if a group of trapped cave explorers choose one of their members to squeeze through a narrow flooded passage to get out to the surface and call for help. The point of the choice is not so that she alone gets saved, but that she's able to bring help and equipment to ensure the rest get rescued. We're not chosen just so we can fly away. Oh, glory, we'll fly away. We're chosen to bring others with us. We are also, too, a royal priesthood. That is, we are a priesthood assigned to the king. We Protestants take our stand on this one, and we are right to do so. 
but we often put the emphasis in the wrong place. We think that the priesthood of all believers only means that we don't need to go to some guy with a clerical collar in order to come to God. We can do it ourselves. Well, yes. I'm not saying that's wrong, but it misses the point. We have been given the extraordinary honor to act as God's priests, even though we don't descend from a priestly family. We can help other people come to God. We're part of the priesthood. We can pray for other people. We can extend forgiveness to the repentant in Jesus' name. We can offer spiritual sacrifices. To be part of the royal priesthood is a remarkable honor and privilege. And it's ours. We are three, a holy nation. Now, by nation, <clears throat> Peter does not mean an ancient province like Asia Minor, nor a modern country like the United States. Um, the word he uses refers to a united people group. And in our case, we are united by a shared relationship with Christ. And that people group is holy. Now, holy does not mean morally superior. It means set apart for God. The great New Testament scholar William Barclay said that the, the main idea the word holy conveys is being different. We're different. And we're different because we're God's. We are for a people belonging to God. In, in the 2011 NIV, that's translated as God's special possession. The King James translates it as a peculiar people. The Net Bible has a people of his own. And if you go through another 20 translations, you'll find about 15 different renderings. That's because these translations are trying to bring out the meaning of a difficult-to-translate Greek word. So here's a picture, though. Think of a woman who has a locket that was given to her by her grandmother. Now, she has lots of other jewelry, almost all of it, with higher monetary value than that old locket. She lends her jewelry freely to her friends, but she never loans out her locket. It is her special possession. She cherishes it and protects it and keeps it for herself. The Greek word that's used here, that's translated in so many different ways, could be used to describe that locket. We are special to God. He cherishes us, protects us, and keeps us for his own. Now, in verse 10, we have two other descriptions of who we are. We are, this is number five, a people who were once not a people. Now, this is not about belonging to God exactly. It's more about belonging to each other. The church of Jesus Christ is transnational. It crosses national borders. It crosses ethnicities. It has people who have little otherwise in common until they have Jesus. And when they have Jesus, they have each other. In Paul's words, each member belongs to all the others. So we have someone now. We have each other. We are a people. We are a people group, the people of Jesus. We are, this is number six, also from verse 10, beneficiaries of mercy. So don't think that we earned a spot among God's people. We did all the right things, so I got in. We weren't so special that God couldn't do without us. It was, I think, for most of us, the opposite. We were timid or we were arrogant, false, fearful, lost, going the wrong way, and obstinate about it. But instead of putting us in our place once for all, God took our place once for all. That's Hebrews chapter 9. So that we could be with him in his place now and forever. That's mercy. 
So that's what Jesus' people are. That's the character stuff. What is it that they do? What's the job description? We find that also in verse 9. But you are a chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What does that mean? It means you are in advertising. The church is God's advertising agency on earth. Imagine you got a job as an editor at ESPN. And you're working with other editors on this big project that's titled G period O period A period T period. And your first big production is to assemble a half hour special on Michael Jordan, his greatest hits, a half hour highlight reel with commentary. And so you have to pick out all these plays. You pick out the foul line dunk shot. You pick out the six three-pointers and one half against the trailblazers. The, the shot over Craig Elo that ends the game and beats the Cavs. The hand-switching layup against the Lakers. And then in the last game of his NBA career, the steal against Carl Malone, the sixth game of the NBA championship. The steal against Carl Malone and then down the court for the final shot of the game to win the sixth NBA championship for the Bulls. Now, when you come to Jesus, you're given similar work to do. Only you are highlighting God. You're not highlighting you. You're highlighting him. You want to convince the world that he is the greatest of all time and eternity. So you choose some highlight creation. The splendors are endless. The brilliance shines everywhere. His absolute power is breathtaking. You choose the appearance to Abraham after God's team failed so miserably. He didn't give up on them. He went to pick them up. You talk about Sinai and the wonderful gift of God's law, but things didn't get better, except for brief periods. They got worse. People became obstinate in their ways. It looks like the game of life has been lost. And then the greatest of God's greatest feats. The word became flesh and lived among us. Instead of rejecting the rebels, he came to them. Instead of despising sinners, he lived with them, ate with them, loved them. Instead of getting rid of them, he died for them. Was it for nothing? It seemed like it until he rose from the dead, the first of humanity to conquer death, but not the last. That's our corporate story. The story we share, the story that's behind all our advertising, that is the good news of God in Christ. Peter says that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The word praises here is not the usual word translated that way. This word is translated in 2 Peter as virtues. It, it has the idea of excellencies, which is how the NASB translates it. In this context, the excellencies are the highlights. They're God's greatest hits, but not just God's greatest hits in the world or in the Bible, but God's greatest hits in your life. Every follower of Jesus should have a personal highlights reel of God's feats in his or her life. We declare the praises of the one who brought us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The one who made our lives worth living. Now, why does God want us to declare his praises? If I got up here on Sunday morning and said, this week, would you tell everybody how great I am? I mean, when you're at work, just mention Shane, you know, he's just wonderful. Is God haughty? Is he proud? 
Does he have something to prove? Not at all. He has nothing to prove. But he does have something to gain. People. Just as he wanted us and chose us, he wants other people, wants them to join him, to be his special possession. He wants them to know him, to have lives worth living. He wants their lives to be saved, not wasted, restored, not ruined. To put it succinctly, God, and Paul does put it succinctly in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, loves all people and wants them to be saved. That's why we declare his praises. But advertising is tricky business. Words matter. As Mitt Romney found out when he ran for president, his marketing firm introduced an app for iPhone with the title, A Better America, I'm with Mitt. It looked good. It had a picture of the White House in the background. Only they misspelled the word America. You know, H&M, the store you see in the malls, they sold a T-shirt with the famous Thomas Edison quote, genius is 1%, inspiration 99% perspiration. They misspelled the word genius. <laughs> Words matter. They matter in our advertising, too. Now, it's not that you need to be clever or funny, though if you are, that's great. But your words need to be filled with grace. Gracious words, they're sometimes funny, sometimes clever, sometimes direct and serious. But they always come from a desire, this is St. Paul, to build others up according to their needs. Words that tear people down. Swearing and condemnation and insults, what Paul calls unwholesome or literally rotten talk, makes God undesirable, even when those words make people laugh. Sexist language and racial slurs from a professing Christian diminish God in people's eyes, even when those people are racist and sexist. Our job is not to try to fit in but to tell out the praises of God. And remember, we're different. I said that words matter. But we can make the mistake of thinking that only words matter. But they're not even the chief thing. People who make commercials understand that the words they use are important, but the backdrop to those words the people that they see, or the smiles on their faces, or the beauty of their surroundings, that can make or break a commercial. When I drive down I-94, I see billboards for casinos. There used to be a lot of them. And if people are pictured, sometimes it's just win this car, but if people are pictured, they are always laughing. And they are always young. And they are almost always attractive, well-dressed women. The words, whatever they say, they may appeal to greed or the desire for excitement or a new car, but the images are what grab people's attention. I have only been in a casino once, and that was an accident. Karen and I were, <laughs> I, you, how do you get into a casino by accident? <laughs> you just have to be Shane and Karen Looper. Anything can happen. We were following our GPS to a steakhouse on the north end of Lake Tahoe, and just over the line in Nevada. And we went past, we were driving down neighborhoods trying to get our way back to where we were supposed to be. We parked and we went in apparently the wrong door because we walked through this long hallway that needed to be painted and there were some closets and I think we walked by the kitchen and then came out into the casino and the restaurant was on the other side. You know what? I did not see a cadre of laughing people. I didn't see groups of 20-year-old beauty pageant contestants. What I saw were grizzled old men 
and disappointed old women downing yet another drink as they sat by the slot machine or whatever it was. It was not a happy place. You know, if people hear our happy words about God, but they see us as angry or hopeless or selfish people, our words will backfire. In the divine plan, we don't merely present advertisements for God. We are advertisements for God. And that brings us to the third issue that affects our impact on the world. The first was we are chosen, we are, we are who we are. Chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's special possession. The second was what we do. We declare the praises of God. We're in advertising. We run the highlight reel of God's greatest hits in creation, in the Bible, but also in our lives. So this third issue is how we do that. So the progression is from who we are to what we do to how we do it. This is verses 11 and 12. Abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans. And good there has, the, there are two words for Greek. This one in Greek for good. This one has the idea of attractive, beautiful. Live such beautiful lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds. Now, abstain has the idea of staying away from something, holding it at a distance. People who are wrapped up in addictions so whether alcohol, drugs, porn, shopping, video games, food, they're not good advertisements for the freedom-bringing Christ. So Peter counsels us to keep away from these things. So just a word of counsel. If you are addicted to any of these or other things, so that you're always thinking about them, planning for them, giving yourself to them at the expense of something else, your first step is to get away from them. And you will likely need help with that. You're not going to be the first person or the first person in our church. We have resources in the church to help. So talk with me. Abstain from sinful desires that wage war against your soul, that leave it full of craters and devastation. Eliminate the negative. Abstain from sinful desires and accentuate the positive. Live such good lives among the pagans. Pagans is just the word, uh, the word ethnos, which means just the people around you, that they may see your good deeds. So Peter's program for declaring God's praises depends on God's people doing good deeds. You know what? He got that straight from Jesus. You must let your light shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Peter's even borrowing the same words. Doing good works is not a requirement for getting into heaven, but it is a requirement for living a worthwhile life on earth. God, who is committed to us and wants us to succeed, has done everything to make that possible. He has personally selected good deeds for you to do. He has arranged opportunities and even put them in your path. St. Paul says, for we are his work created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared in advance that we should do them, or literally, that we should walk in them. In other words, God has placed these good works for us to do right along our path. We don't need to go out of our way to find them. We just need to do them. So, let me ask, is your life characterized by good deeds? When was the last time you did one? Now, they don't have to be, and rarely are, anything big. It might be to pray for someone. It might be to help them when they're in trouble, to feed them when they're hungry, to encourage them when they're down, to give them money when they're in need. These, sometimes people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm widowed, I'm old, 
There's not much for me to do anymore. There's still good deeds for you to do. There are phone calls to be made. There are notes to be sent. There are things that you can do. And you know what? I think God is preparing a highlight reel of his children's good deeds. And heaven's going to sit around and say, did you see that? And love it to the glory of God. A life without good deeds is not good advertising for the transforming power of our God. So we've looked at who we are, what we do, how we do it. The only thing left is why we do it. Why do we live a different kind of life than the people around us? Why do we advertise God's excellencies rather than our own? We do it, verse 12, so that people will glorify God when he comes to visit us. There are many aspects of the commitment to the world that involve lots of other things. Justice, for example. But at the heart of it all is our longing to see the world and all its people restored to their loving creator. Now that longing must not remain abstract and broad. It must become concrete and particular. And so I'm going to ask you to ask God to give you someone, a neighbor, a friend, a family member, a coworker, maybe an enemy, whom you can pray for and to whom you can advertise the excellencies of God with the desire that that person will glorify God on the day he comes. So I'm going to ask you to pull out one of those yellow pieces of scrap paper that are in the chair pocket in front of you. And I'm going to give you a moment to pray about this. And if someone comes to mind, write their name down. If they don't come to mind, take the paper home and keep praying. And let God give you someone that you can help bring to God. All right, let's pray. I'll give you a minute. If you have that person's name or those person's names, write them down right now. And start praying for them and praying for your interactions with them. God, bring good out of this for people so that they know who you are and that you love them, that you really are the greatest of all time and eternity. Lord, we are worried about blunders and wrong words, and but take us beyond our worries and into the reality of your grace and power and use us for good in Jesus' name. Amen. and invite you to stand with me as we sing Abide With Me. Abide with me Fast falls the eventide The darkness deepens Lord, with me abide When other help 
and comforts flee. Help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. I need thy presence every passing hour. What but thy grace can foil the tempter's power? Who like thyself my guide and stay can be? Cloud and sunshine, Lord, abide with me. There are go deep sheets that will help you think through 1 Peter 2, 9 through 12 in a, in a deeper way and help you apply it to your life. They're back there on the table. They're just a series of questions for you to look at the text and answer. I encourage you to pick one up before you leave today. Uh, we'll have prayer helpers right over here. If you have prayer need in your life, just come on up by the organ and somebody will be here to pray with you. Let's pray now together. Help us to recognize the things that you've put in our way for us to do this week. Not to walk around them to save a minute or to save a dollar. Help us to engage. And I pray out of that you'll bring good for others, but also for us. And help us to know you better. And I ask for this in Jesus' good name. And now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of his spirit be with each of us now and evermore. Amen.